Good morning, this is Barbara Slavin. It's June 26th, Natick, Massachusetts. We're interviewing Mr. Isidore Cutler as part of our Veterans Oral History Project. Uh, welcome, Mr. C uh, Cutler. Is, uh, what is your first name? Isidore. And what do people call you? Eddie. Eddie, okay. And could you tell me, do you mind my asking what your age is? I'm 70, I'm going to be, in fact, uh, I was just uh, 77 years old. Great. And where do you live? I live in Framingham, Massachusetts. Okay. And uh, are you married? Yes, I am. Okay. Do you have any children? I have three children. And any grandchildren? Yes, I have four grandchildren. Uh -huh. Where were you born? I was born in Waltham, Massachusetts. And what was Waltham like then? Waltham was a very nice, quaint little town at that time. It was a city, but I, it was more like a town. Mm -hmm. Everyone knew each, one, each other. Right. And uh, did you, were you in Waltham until you joined the service? Yes, I was. Okay. What is your family background? Uh, my folks come from Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my dad worked in Waltham uh, for 10 years before he brought, was able to uh, earn enough money to bring my mother over mm -hmm. and my brother. So he came by himself at the beginning. Some charitable organization brought him to this country. For, from what country in Europe? The Pol Polish, I'm not sure if it was Poland or Russia, but it was on the Polish-Russian border. Had, had he ever served in any armed services? Yes, he was. He was in the Russian army. The Russian army? Yes. Did he ever tell you stories about that? Never. Never? Never. Is that because he didn't want to talk about it or because he, he didn't uh, Well, do he anything? probably didn't have very good experiences at yeah. that time. Being Jewish at that time oh. in the country, they have programs and things like that. So he probably never wanted to uh, talk about unpleasant things with his children. Mm. When and where did you enter the military? I, uh, I started by... Uh, taking a course at uh, Springfield Trade School mm -hmm. when I first enlisted in the Army. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they sent me to Camp Crowder, Missouri for uh, basic training. Mm -hmm. uh, they never fulfilled their, uh, their uh, promise to me that I would go to OCS and become a warrant officer. In fact, I never saw a radio re uh, again once I entered the actual active service. Tell me what happened between the time you were inducted and, the, and you're going to school in Springfield. I'm missing a step here. You, well, were, you joined the Army and then right. you went to school in Springfield? The Army sent me to school. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, uh, sent me to the school and it was actually civilian and army instructors mm -hmm. at that school in Springfield. And how did you like school? I, I liked it very much. And how long was training? Uh, I was there only for, I think it was six months or nine months, something like that. And then what happened next? You were sent to camp? Then they sent me home mm -hmm. with a 30-day delay on route, and I had to report to Fort Devens, and from Fort Devens they sent me to Camp Crowder, Missouri for basic training. Would you repeat the name of that camp again? The camp Crowder, Missouri. Crowder, okay. And what? And this is where. And what kind of training did you, re, did you receive there? Well, that was all kinds of basic training, uh, th uh, things that you'd have to know how to survive in actual combat. It was, it was really more like uh, infantry, infantry training rather than uh, signal corps training. You. Uh, was there a means for you to take it up with the Army that you were trained to be a radio man and they wanted you in the infantry? Once you join the Army, you have no recourses, and as a buck private, you have no recourse. Mm -hmm. You can't talk to anyone about anything. Mm -hmm. You can try, but it doesn't do you any good. And I did try. I, I understand you entered the military uh, December 1942. Right. And uh, why did you join the military? Well, at the time, I, I wasn't able to go to college, and mm -hmm. at the time, the, uh, all the emotions were stirred up, mm -hmm. and I thought it was the thing to do. 
Did you develop any close friendships during basic training? Uh, I did have a couple of friends, mm -hmm. yes. Not too many, mm -hmm. because, uh, it was because of the situation and the, the type of camp that I was in. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what did you specialize in when you were in the Army? Ultimately, I became a heavy truck driver. Mm -hmm. Did you like that? Not really. It, do, it doesn't really take too much uh, effort to become a truck driver. I, was, I knew how to drive to start with, and it was right. just a little training for night driving and mm -hmm. things like that. Did the military prepare you for cultural differences you might be facing? For example, you might have been mixed in with different ethnic groups or different races? Uh, or I don't think so. They did uh, give you a pamphlet to read as to, uh, when you were in the different countries of things they expected you, uh, you to do in, in the uh, country, but uh, otherwise, no, not in between your uh, different soldiers. Mm -hmm. And where was your first duty station after your training? After the first place was mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, uh, it was a camp in Liverpool, England. Mm -hmm. and I don't know the name of the camp. I only know there was a camp of advanced basic training mm -hmm. because uh, from there, uh, one night, <laughs> the, uh, we weren't fed very well there. And then one night, all of a sudden, they told us to uh, come down to for, for dinner and <laughs> from having very little to eat, they gave us a choice of anything we wanted to eat on the menu. This is in Liverpool? At that last camp, yes. Right. And uh, after dinner that night was the first time that they issued us live ammunition. Mm -hmm. And uh, about an hour later, I found myself on an LST in the English Channel. Heading where? Heading for Normandy Beach. And what happened next? What happened next was landing at Normandy Beach, in which a very large percentage of the men that, were, that I was with were killed instantly. What was your role in the landing? What were you supposed to be doing? At that time, I was carrying a walkie-talkie, and my rifle. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, we were just trying to establish a beachhead. So you were a regular infantry soldier. I was during, actually you know. signal corps attached to the infantry, but I actually was in the infantry at so that time. What were you thinking when you were in the channel heading for Normandy? I was thinking that I was a <laughs> that I would be very lucky to come out of this alive. It was, uh, not a, it was not a good experience. And what was the landing like? Well, the, uh, L the LST opened up and we got out, off into the water. And we were carrying, I had the, uh, the uh, walkie-talkie strapped to my back. And I was carrying my rifle over my head. And uh, the water was probably up to my shoulders when we got out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the firing was coming from, they were shooting down from the hill. The Germans were shooting down. And um, all I could see was all the bodies floating around. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, and the, the sky was full of airplanes. There must have been thousands of airplanes in the sky. How was the noise? There was a, a, lot, of, a lot of noise, a lot of uh, firing and uh, mostly, mostly, of course, from the German side. Mm -hmm. Did you actually see the Germans or you just? I did not actually see the Germans at the beginning. It wasn't until the uh, following day that I saw Germans. Do you remember any smells? Any, could you remember smelling anything? No, I just remember seeing a lot of blood in the water. What happened next? Well, what happened next, we got onto the land and uh, they, got us, they, they got us walking up into it. And then they, uh, the, the first night that I was there, 
we were in um, like trenches, but they weren't really trenches that we had made. It was more like underbrush. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then from then on, we we they had us spreading out. They were taking count of how many men were left and who was left. We did lose a lot of officers too at that time. What would you say the temperature was uh, at the time of the invasion, during the day and during the night? Well, it was, I would say it was cool. I don't really remember that. I know that it, would, it started raining right away. Mm -hmm. It was raining because I know that right after that they had a hard time getting the, um, the uh, off the ships, they had a hard time getting the tanks. The tanks were sinking into the ground. Mm -hmm. But I don't really remember exactly what the temperature yeah. was. So take us to what happens next. Well, next we, were, we moved right along. We were walking along. On the, they had uh, men walking on both sides of the uh, roads. Uh, and uh, when we, when we uh, had resistance from these other men, Actually, the Germans were starting little by little. They were retreating, mm -hmm. and um, we had an experience in going into. Uh, I was in a town called Shawnee in uh, France, in which uh, the farmer called the, the officer over, and uh, he took a couple of us with him. The farmer wanted to show us something in his barn. And uh, when we went into the barn, he uh, took a pitchfork and took the hay off, a lot of hay off, and there were two dead soldiers there that he had killed himself with pitchforks. What nas what Germans. 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 Okay. And um, we had a problem in one of the buildings there that they were going to use as a little bit of a headquarters for a day or two, uh, and they found that uh, somebody from the group went in there and they found that it had all been booby trapped. So they, uh, they uh, were very careful about, uh, they told us not to touch anything until they had special men come in to take care of that. And then from there we moved along and uh, the next place I remember going through in the middle of the night was a place called St. Lo which the only building left, this was after the air raid that they had there, and the only building left standing was the church. Mm. After, the, after you landed as an infantryman, a fighting man, when did you start driving a truck? Uh, that probably took place about, I'd say maybe two weeks later. Was that before or after St. Lowe? Uh, that was after St. Lowe. Lowe. Okay. That was after St. Lowe. St. Lowe, and St. Lowe, what the uh, army, what they did was they dropped leaflets to the people telling them that the town was going to be bombed. Mm -hmm. And then the other side of St. Lowe, there was a big mountain. And the people all left the town and went underneath the mountain while the bombing was going on so that they wouldn't get killed. How did they go underneath the mountain? They had it, it was like a tunnel. Okay. And they went there, and um, they, then after the air raid was over, they came back out. But the only building left was the, everything was in smoldering around it, except for the church. Did you have any contact with civilians? Uh, well, they had, a, they had a policy at that time of no fraternization. They didn't want you talking to anyone, or, because you didn't know if you were talking to a French person or a German, you would never know. Do you feel you were well-dressed enough for the oh, weather? Oh yeah, I had, the clothes yeah. that we had was sufficient. Mm -hmm. We had, you know, it was, uh, when it was warm, it was warm. When it was cold, it was yeah. cold. Uh, I remember at, uh, at one time it was very cold, but I, I don't really remember being cold. Mm -hmm. We had to dig our own foxholes. And uh, I do remember, I do have a very <laughs> a funny experience of going to bed one night in the foxhole and getting up in the morning and finding myself up to here in water. Because oh. there were these little, um, uh, like, uh, what do they call those little things that make holes in the ground? Like, 
I forget what they call those Gulf little animals. Gopher? Or? Uh, well, something like that, but yeah. they make holes. And because of those holes, when it was raining yeah. during the night, the water poured through those holes and came into <laughs> the foxhole was covered. So that was, a, that was, so in that case, I had to have all my clothes changed. But I uh, didn't have any trouble with clothes. How about food? Food at the beginning, the first, at the beginning it was a problem because uh, what they gave us was a concentrated candy bar, which did a job on our stomachs. Mm -hmm. That was the only thing you had at the beginning. And that, we ate, we had, that was the only thing we had for about the first 10 days. Every time you felt a little hungry, yeah. you took a little bite of that, but it really made you in, did you in tough shape? You became constipated mm -hmm. from it and everything. Then we went to uh, C rations. Then they went to K rations. Then they went to ten and ones. And ten and ones is a the, is a box of food that they give you. It's enough for ten people. Actually, it was enough for more than ten, but they call it ten and ones. Mm -hmm. And it would have things in it like powdered eggs, uh, bacon. Uh, being, and all different kinds of things. But a lot of it was really wasted because the, they would like give you a package of five pounds of bacon. And who's gonna eat five, you know? Uh, so what we did do a lot of times was take the food, even though it was supposedly off limits, we would take what was left over and barter it mm -hmm. with the French farmers. Instead of using the powdered eggs, we would sell them the the, um, we would change, we wasn't really selling, we would barter the uh, bacon for fresh eggs. Ah. And uh, I had a very, in I had an interesting experience one time. I was really dying for a glass of milk. So I was out in the field and the farmer's cows were out there and I made the <laughs> mistake, I made the mistake of milking the cow into my canteen. I would have been better off if I had did it, done it into my helmet. Instead, I did it in my canteen, right. and it was so good, I filled the canteen up again, <laughs> and I figured I'd keep it forgetting about the refrigeration. <laughs> so, of course, when I went the next day to open it up to see, it was terrible, and I had a hard time with sand and rocks and everything before I could get that thing cleaned out so I could <laughs> use it again. Well, take us on the progress of the war from uh, after the invasion, from, from your, your progress. Well, the from there we went on, we went through Belgium. Belgium was uh, one of the pictures that I have here. Belgium was, uh, was a very interesting place. It, it was in Spa, Belgium, that we had, uh, in the center of the town, there's a big casino. And I was in there, and, and one part of it is like a bathhouse. And it was a chance that I had to uh, go in, and they had these big copper tubs. And you would get undressed and go in, and, and it was in mineral water. There was mineral water in there, and they had women there who would come in with these brushes and everything and do your backs. And uh, then afterwards, they would give you a rub down, you know, <laughs> which was very nice. And then in that same building, but on the other side, they had a casino, and at night, uh, they would uh, have different uh, types of entertainment, and they would alternately let different servicemen go in there. One night, we went in there, and uh, they had Marlena Dietrich there. Wow. Yeah. And um, that was a, an interesting experience. And at that time, we lived very well because they had us staying in a uh, hotel at the top of a hill in uh, Spa, Belgium. Mm -hmm. But then I had a, ba a very bad job to do from there. Uh, they had the Battle of the Bulge mm -hmm. uh, took place and then uh, they, the uh, Germans had captured a good number of American soldiers and they tied their hands behind their back and they shot them to apart with their tanks. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a detail in which they picked me, was one of the detail, to go to help bury the bodies, parts, parts of bodies and bodies. And what was the name of that massacre? That was, a, that was uh, I, can't, I don't remember the name of it. I know that uh, 
That was at the... Uh, I think it was the Malmody Massacre? Right, I think so. Yeah, yeah I know it took place in Malmody, that, right. that I know. In fact, I had a fellow, a, a kid who went to school with me in high school, a fellow by the name of Henry Cantor, who was captured there, but who was taken as a prisoner. And he was sent to, uh, he was sent to uh, overseas without any basic training at all. He was in a program called the STP program in this country, where they took, they were training him for something, and uh, they, uh, it was towards the end of the war, and they didn't let them finish the program, and they didn't give him basic training or anything, and he found himself in, um, in Europe, and he was a prisoner of the war, and they treated him very poorly, and they have, right now he still lives in uh, Newton or Brookline. They, they've had to remove half, three quarters of his stomach because of the way they fed them and everything. Mm. Germans did not treat Americans. It's not like um, we treated them, that's for sure. Now, when were you at the aftermath of the massacre, roughly? Do you remember when that was? Where was I? When was that, that you were? Well, it must have been very shortly afterwards. Okay. And what, they had you bury the bodies? Right. Okay. It was temporary graves before they moved them. But they didn't want the parts and the bodies out in the, you know, to be... You, you mentioned before the Battle of the Bulge. Were you involved in that? No. Okay. No, I was in Spa, Belgium at the time. Okay. And what happened after uh, the Malmody well, after massacre that, aftermath? After that, that was the really almost the end of the war as far as what the Germans was concerned because after that uh, the Americans really went after them in a big way but the Germans uh, t were turning around and when we were in Spa, Belgium by the way, uh, that's when the Germans started using the buzz bombs mm -hmm. and every time uh, at night we would start to hear the uh, earth and the building vibrating. Mm -hmm. As long as you heard the vibration, you didn't have to worry because you knew the buzz bomb was still in the air. Mm -hmm. But as soon as, you, as the sound stopped, mm -hmm. from that point on, the buzz bomb was floating on its own and you never knew where it was going to land. Once it landed, of course, it would do a lot of destruction. Uh, most of the, when I was in Spa, Belgium, and those bombs were going over, most of the damage that was being done the bombs were landing in a town called Verviers, which was not too far away from Spa, mm -hmm. and it destroyed complete streets. Mm. Tell us what a buzz bomb is, as best a, you can. A buzz bomb is probably one of the first rockets that was mm -hmm. ever uh, uh, invented, and it was, uh, un it was an unmanned uh, unit that was filled with explosives. They were, uh, the Germans were using that as a terror tactic. And then, uh, of course, they, at the end, that was their, practically the end of their uh, gasoline supply, I think, because uh, they shipped us, at that time, we, I left and I drove, too. I, that, what, that night I was driving the big truck uh, on the back road and I ended up in Maastricht, Holland. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was on Christmas Day, I think. And we had one of the worst air attacks that we've ever, that we ever uh, had uh, from the Germans. Mm -hmm. Germans were dropping bombs like mad. And it was very shortly after that that the war was over. When you drove the truck, what was in the truck? Uh, supplies and men. I wanted to ask you, you mentioned Marlena Dietrich. Was she part of a USO show? Yes. Did you yeah. see any, anyone else in USO shows? No, that was the only USO show that oh, really? I saw. What else did you do for rest of uh, R&R? The uh, Army sent me one time to Paris, uh, and I, uh, was, I stayed at a hotel. They put me in a hotel called the Hotel Garde de l'Est. Yeah. And that's on the east side of Paris, right across the street from the railroad station. And uh, they gave me a full, I think it must have been a full month's supply of rations when they sent me there. And I used those rations to um, 
barter with the French people. At this point, did you feel freer to socialize? With oh, yeah. The yeah. At that time, they were allowing us to, uh, to socialize with the people. And I met some uh, other, uh, being Jewish myself, I looked, out, uh, looked for some Jewish people there who uh, treated me very nicely and who had been uh, deprived of many things during the, um, those war years so that the, uh, the rations I had helped them out. And meanwhile, they uh, took me in like a member of their family. Did you go to nightclubs or restaurants? They, they took me to, uh, to a nightclub one night mm -hmm. and uh, I went to the synagogue a couple of times with them. So it, it was uh, very nice. I tried to keep contact with them after the war, but uh, for some reason or other, there was never any return. I sent letters, but never any return mail. So I don't know what really happened to them. They were an older, they were an older family, even though the one of they there was a younger uh, daughter there that was part of a, I think part of their son's family. You mentioned uh, at some point um, on the telephone when I was talking to you that you were present at the liberation of yes, uh, Buchenwald. Buchenwald. Right. Can you tell me what that was like? Yeah, that was that was a, t a horrible experience to come into that Buchenwald and to find the um, to see the crematorium that they had there and the piles of human bones, and the, they had the army put some kind of um, we put some kind of disinfectant around the bones that they gave us t to sprinkle around. And um, you could see the maggots coming out of the earth that were eating the bones. Unbelievable. What was your role in the, in the liberation? Well, what we did was we, were, we came in, and uh, the truth of the matter is that the, um, the soldiers had left. The German soldiers had left, mm -hmm. and uh, we walked into the camp, and they had the remaining people who were there were all skin and bones. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom of the hill, this was in, in a town called Weimar, Germany. Mm -hmm. At the bottom of the hill, uh, there was an old uh, German officer's army camp, and uh, we used, uh, we took a lot of these prison, these uh, people who had been abused at the camp down and to give them something to do, just to give them, not that we needed their help really, but it was just to keep them active. But they couldn't even, they, it was hard to get it into their head that we were going to be feeding them regularly. Mm -hmm. So that when they came down and where the Germans had left the army camp, they had left a lot of food around, like barrels, don't forget, that was in the summertime. That was very hot. Mm -hmm. They had left barrels of uh, things like uh, strawberry, some kind of uh, desserts with the bugs and everything mm -hmm. in them, you know. And these people couldn't get it through their head. They, were gonna, they would be scooping it up, mm -hmm. eating it, even though they weren't hungry. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, the officer in charge of our outfit at that time went into the town. And of course, the people there said that they had the, the song and dance that they didn't know what was going on there. Yeah. I mean, the truth of the matter was that you could smell it 20 miles away, but they didn't know what was going on. So he had the whole town lined up and walked up the hill and walked through the camp to make sure that they knew, okay. uh, to see what they had been uh, accomplished. You know, they had uh, uh, let go on without doing anything about it. And of course, there were other atrocities performed there, like that. Uh, the, uh, the commandant of that camp was uh, was uh, General Kausch, mm -hmm. and his wife they call her Fro Kausch. Mm -hmm. She was a very sadistic person. Did you ever hear about her? Mm -hmm. You know, she had men skinned alive and made lampshades out of theirs. Um, skin, mm -hmm. and then uh, when they after the Nuremberg trials, they put her in prison. 
but uh, the result, the final result was some American captain went in there and they had some relationship together and she became pregnant and they let her out of jail. Oh. That you didn't know, did you? No, I didn't. Yeah. Were, uh, what were your duties uh, in the, lib were, you the, were you in the liberation to be shown how horrible the Germans were? Did you have specific duties to do Just, in the well, camp? The specific duties was to make sure that the people were being fed Okay. We've been taken care of, and we distributed clothes to them, and uh, distributed them uh, um, like things like soap and stuff like that, so that they'd be able to clean themselves up. It was the the uh, stench in the place was terrible. It was awful. Do you remember some of the things that some of the uh, people from the camp would say to you? Well. The <laughs> A lot of them would talk to us, but of course I didn't understand a lot of the things that they were saying. Uh, uh, we could understand when they were, you know, through, like sign language, mm -hmm. the, the things that they told us that they had uh, gone through, the, um, the beatings that they had gone mm -hmm. through. You could see the, the uh, things where they had, where they had hung people. Mm -hmm. It was a terrible experience. Did they think? Were they thanking you as well? I imagine. Oh yes, yeah. they couldn't. Uh, yeah. They couldn't thank the people, the soldiers enough. In fact, we were at a um, uh, at a uh, not very long ago here at the Natick Labs. We were at a. Um, they had a mem memorial for that. They had this fellow. What was his name? Steve. What's his name? Grossman, who had been a prisoner at um, one of the army camp, one of those uh, camps. And uh, he was standing there thanking the American soldiers uh, for what they had yeah. done. Yeah. And he's tried to help people since he's been in this country. I think he's a psychiatrist. After the uh, liberation of Buchenwald, uh, where did you go next? From there, they sent me back to. Um, to a camp called uh, in France, someplace in France, I don't know where it was, but they called it Camp Lucky Strike. And from the, uh, we stayed there up until the time they put us on a ship, sending us back home, and, and that was a good experience. Yeah. The ship coming home was a good experience yeah. because that was an American Liberty ship. Even though I'm not a, much of a sailor and I was sick <laughs> on the ship anyway, yeah. but still it was a nice, clean yeah. ship and they fed you properly and everything. And then um, uh, it was, like I said, I had a, they sent me home for a while and then I had to report back to Camp Bowie, Texas. Can you tell me what Camp Lucky Strike was about? Well, it was just a recuperative camp mm -hmm. to take life easy and to wait until you got home. And, yeah, yeah, and then they were telling you about the number of points that each soldier had and how long it would take before they went home. Did you have any injuries? I had lost a tooth. Uh, what happened was I was in a Jeep. This is before they had me doing the actual driving the trucks. I was in a Jeep with somebody who uh, tipped over. Mm -hmm. And I must have hit a rock, and it broke a tooth in half, so I had to have it pulled out. And uh, then I was very fortunate that there was a, a dental officer there who actually, on the battlefield, had a tooth made for me <laughs> and put it into my mouth. And I operated a foot. Have you ever seen a foot drill? No. <laughs> they have a drill. Uh, and uh, it's and there's no of course there was no electricity or anything on the on the field and I operated it for him with and of course when it start, started hurting I would stop pedaling but it was like a something like a uh, sewing machine right you know you would just pump it and that and he replaced the tooth and over the years of course I've had a lot of trouble since then because that one tooth ended up now to where I'm, I'm missing seven teeth. You mentioned that you had a good trip on the way home. Uh, what, do you remember the name of the ship you were on? No. I, How about, I, I should have asked you this before, but the trip uh, on the way over to Liverpool. It was terrible. Okay. It was on a, an Australian ship with manned by an English crew. Mm -hmm. It was, without a question of doubt, one of the filthiest things I've ever seen. You couldn't even drink a cup of coffee. If you went to hold a cup, the, uh, the coffee pot, your hand would slide off because it was of the grease and the oil on it. 
and uh, I, we were all very sick going through the North Atlantic in the middle of the winter, mm -hmm. and uh, they actually sold us the rations that were put on the ship, the regular food they gave us, but the, if you were sick and you wanted an orange or a grapefruit or an apple or something, they mm -hmm. sold it to us for a dollar apiece. Who's they? The the uh, it, the actual people selling it to us was the English crew, but it had to have been condoned by the American officers that were on the ship because they were in charge of distributing the food, really. You you remember it to this day? Are you uh, do you feel bitterness about it? Well, I feel very bad about it yeah. that the American uh, officer who was there to protect his soldiers. After all, on the battlefield, it's uh, each man depends on his his next the next man to to uh, protect his life. How do you feel about the leadership uh, that you were given? I thought it was pretty good. Okay. What did you know about the Germans before you faced them? Well, I only knew stories that I had heard from them. I knew they were they were really very brutal soldiers. They were, they were uh, not like Americans. Americans are not killers at heart. Mm -hmm. The Germans, I think, are. Mm -hmm. After you returned to the United States, what happened then? Well, when I returned, uh, first thing was I, I uh, got married. I married my childhood sweetheart. Oh. I, uh, I've known my wife since she was about 10 years old. And uh, we just celebrated our 50, I think it was either 56th or 57th wedding anniversary. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And um, uh, we went to, uh, on, we, we got married and we went to uh, New York on our honeymoon. And uh, while we were on our honeymoon, there was a, an unusual uh, thing took place. An airplane hit the Empire State Building. Oh. Could you hear anything? We did. We we were in the hotel room at the time, and I got very nervous. I thought someone had dropped a bomb. <laughs> the war is not over. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. And then, uh, and then from there, I of course I had to uh, go back and report back to Camp Bowie, Texas, mm -hmm. where I uh, my wife had a girlfriend whose uh, brother uh, worked at Army Headquarters, and he told her that my name was on the list to go to uh, uh, Japan. And uh, fortunately, the war came to an end before that took place, even though they sent me to Camp Bowie, Texas, for more advanced training. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was discharged at that camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, they gave me 200 and some odd dollars car fare to go back home. What was your homecoming like? Well, we had a big party. It was very, you know, it was exciting to be home, was to, to see everybody. Actually, when I, I went home, first I was at, uh, my wife comes from New York. Mm -hmm. So I went to New York, of course, and my family, my own personal family is in Waltham. So uh, we had a big party in uh, New York, and then we came home, and uh, we had another party. And uh, that was about it on the on the uh, war. How do you feel about the difference between the, uh, your homecoming and perhaps the homecoming that a Vietnam veteran might have received? I think it's disgusting the way the the Vietnam veterans have been treated. I feel very bad that this country has money for so many different things, but not no money to support the plan of taking these people who really need uh, physical and mental help. To go through the streets of Boston and see these poor fellows laying on the streets, mm -hmm. I think is a disgrace. Did you uh, take part after you were discharged in any veterans benefits, for example, the GI Bill? I did. I uh, I went to school. Uh, I uh, went to uh, BU for two years, but 
my family was growing. I couldn't really finish. Even while I was going to school, because of the fact that I had to keep, I had to work. I got up early in the morning to go to work. I would go to work about five o'clock in the morning. And uh, then I'd come home and I'd have to rush through dinner and rush into Boston. And uh, uh, my wife is the one who helped me through the, actually I'm surprised that I did as well as I did at college. I, all my grades were all passing grades, but my wife would do the uh, reading for me and give me a, um, a summary of the different chapters and everything and I would do my exams based on what she gave me. So that actually she deserved the credit for uh, the marks. What did you study? I took business administration. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course there's a lot of books they have you read and things and she would do the reading and give me a synopsis of what she had read. And I would base my uh, answers on all those things. And, um, but I wasn't able to really uh, continue on because the, uh, my family started growing and uh, it was just too much. What work did you do? I was in the dry cleaning and laundry business. And uh, my wife worked along with me all those years. So uh, we had our business, in, first we had businesses in Waltham and then I had business in Framingham for the, mm -hmm. 26 years I had a place in Framingham. I wanted to ask you, what, how do you look back on, your, on the war effort in World War II? Well, I think that um, the people at home deserved a lot of credit for what they accomplished. Mm -hmm. I mean, we went from a country that was never was really thinking about war to a country that was able to outproduce the whole world. I thought that uh, they did a great job in supplying the men and women of the armed service with everything they really needed, clothes, mm -hmm. shoes, armaments, everything. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there should be no gripe on that score at mm -hmm. all. It's just too bad that, a, that our politicians today don't have the same type of initiative for, uh, to take care of this country the way uh, instead of themselves the way they should. Mm -hmm. How important uh, was serving in the military to you? At the time it was very important. If I, I look back on it now, I'm wondering to myself, uh, I realize that, um, you know, that we have the best country in the world no matter what, even with what's going on in our politics, it, politics today, mm -hmm. still I feel that uh, we should be doing a lot more in this country. I feel that uh, this country has great things ahead of it if they would only uh, really look into what they're doing, make, make it possible for senior citizens to live properly. Mm -hmm. to, they, they should be able to, they shouldn't have to worry about prescription drugs and, and housing and mm -hmm. things like that. After all, if we have we are the richest country in the world. We should be able to give our senior citizens and our young people their education and everything. There's no reason that anybody in this country shouldn't have what they need. Before we end the interview, is there anything else that you'd like to share with someone who might be watching this tape for posterity? Well, just the fact that war is a terrible thing mm -hmm. and that it would be much better if everything could be settled amicably and peacefully mm -hmm. because there is um, absolutely no reason why people should go along and kill one another mm -hmm. and, no, and there's no reason why people should have to suffer. Well, thank you very much for the interview. Thank I really you. appreciate thank it. Thank you very much, thank too. Thank you.